Everybody remember Tweety and Sylvester? Lauren doesn't. <clears throat> I've used a lighthearted picture for the introduction to a message that may be somewhat on the dark side this morning. Now those of you, most of you present here will remember Sylvester and Tweety, but those listening in other countries and um, the younger ones may not remember or have a clue as to who we're talking about. What I have to talk about this morning is not always pleasant, just as Sylvester's failure to catch the Tweety Bird will always left him feeling rather unpleasant. There are many today who would say that what I will share has no bearing for the modern Christian who truly understands God's intent and purpose for us. However, I have not yet come to the place where I get to pick and choose which scriptures I believe and which ones I discard. Our scripture reading today has us in the book of Hebrews, which is all about, the book of Hebrews is all about comparing Jesus uh, to everything that the Jews held dear, everything that they believed, everything that was a part of their religion. The book of Hebrews compares that all the way through. And the writer of Hebrews goes to great lengths to show that Jesus is better than anything they had ever known or anything they will know. And the same is true for us. There is none greater than Jesus. One aspect of his greatness is his lowliness. He chose to become a human. He came to us as a baby in the weakness of human flesh. Paul tells us in Philippians that he not only did that, but he humbled himself even further by accepting death. We read in Philippians chapter 2 and verse 8, And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. So not only the lowliness of becoming human and not only the lowliness of the cessation of life, but even the manner of the ending of his life was part of the plan for our benefit through his humility. I want to focus on that one aspect from the life of Jesus as we find it in the letter to the Hebrews. For it was fitting that he, referring to God, for, for whom and by whom all things exist in bringing many sons to glory, should make the founder of their salvation, Jesus, perfect through suffering. Now the last statement of that verse should cause you to question some things. It is talking about Jesus and it says that he was made perfect. Wasn't he already perfect? Now that's the belief of many, but it is not necessarily what we learn from the Bible. In Luke chapter 2 and verse 52, we read, And Jesus increased in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. Now the word stature simply refers to his natural growth as a human being from a baby to a child, a teenager to an adult. But Luke also tells us that Jesus increased in wisdom and in favor with God and man. To increase would certainly imply a growth from a lesser to a greater condition. Then we have another place in Hebrews which speaks of his growth. In chapter 5 and verse 8 it says, Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. Here it says he learned how to obey. It was a process. Now these passages indicate that the child Jesus was not perfect, not complete in his beginnings. Now, I know that some people will allow their mind to start wandering off into thinking about sinless perfection, but that is not what these verses are talking about. There's no implication or indication in the thought of growth and learning that any kind of sin was involved. 
Yet that is where most people go whenever the thought of perfection comes up. I have yet to quote, and this is in 60 years of ministry, I have yet to quote Matthew 5, 48, and someone will say, nobody's perfect. Matthew 5, 48 says, it's from the Sermon on the Mount, it says, you shall be perfect even as your heavenly Father is perfect. And whenever I read that verse, somebody will pipe up and say, nobody's perfect. They're going to object. Are they objecting to the scripture or to some thought? I don't know. But it's always been fascinating to me. <clears throat> now that's a whole, it's a whole other subject. And it's probably one we should talk about sometime, but not this morning. But we do need to talk about Jesus' perfection and the fact that he had to grow into it. But I want you to be clear, the Bible can speak of being perfect without the thought of sinless perfection being, but we're not talking about sin, we're talking about something else. We know that Jesus had no sin until he became sin for us, as we read in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 21, for our sake, he, that is God, made him, Jesus, to be sin, who knew no sin, okay? He did not ever know sin, but he became sin for us. But let's get back to the subject of his suffering and its effects. He learned from what he suffered, and he left us an example that we should also learn from what we suffer. Experience is supposed to be a good teacher, but only if we can learn something from our experience. Now I've had to go through some things more than once, many, many times, before I could learn what I was supposed to know. Now maybe I'm different from everybody else, but experience is supposed to teach us and it eventually will. So what is suffering? Simply put, suffering is anything with which you are discomforted. discomforted. That's suffering. Doesn't have to be anything traumatic. It can be great or it can be small. But those two concepts are actually in the eye of the beholder. Because I'm sure you've heard the statement, don't cry over spilled milk. Now, for the observer, it is simply a glass of milk having been spilled on the table. But for the person crying over it, it may be number 29 in a long list of things that have happened all day. And it's more than they can take. It's piled on many other things and it's produced suffering. So the first thing we should learn is that we're not to judge what is or is not suffering for someone else. For us, individually, we can decide. If it's uncomfortable, you can call it suffering. You know what it's like when you get an itch on your back that you can't reach anymore to scratch. It's suffering until you can get that puppy taken care of. Remember, I told you recently that you cannot love anyone whom you judge. And if you're judging their suffering, you can't love them. And if you're assessing the level of their suffering, then you are judging them. And that's not what we're called to do. We're supposed to be able to comfort others whenever they are going through their tough time. It's what we read in 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 4, that God comforts us in all our affliction so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. <clears throat> we don't know how to comfort others, especially when we see them in tremendous pain, physical, emotional, spiritual. We often, at least for me, I find myself at a loss for words, how to comfort someone. And yet that's supposed to be my part of my ministry, is to be there to comfort and to comfort with words. But I get lost. I don't know how. I had an opportunity last night that was totally different for me. <clears throat> I had to go out to watch the football game I wanted to see. 
And so I stopped down here at the Viking where I knew they'd be broadcasting the game. And there was an old gentleman sitting next to me. And when he was coming back from the restroom, I saw him stop at a table and just stand there bent over for a long time. Looked like he was trying to catch his breath or something. Then when he came around to reseat himself, he again stopped. And I could see there was something going on. So I reached over and just laid my hand on his arm. And I said, sir, are you all right? It's amazing what that bit of concern did for that gentleman. That was an eye opener for me. I, I had no idea the impact that it would have on someone's life. That's what we're called to do, is to comfort people. And like I say, we may not always know how. I didn't know that's what I was doing. I was genuinely concerned for the gentleman. I didn't want him passing out on the floor or whatever. We are called to be the source of comfort for those who may be suffering. When we are in contact with it, when we come across it. Now, there are many today, especially on some of my streams on Facebook, who say that as children of God, we should not suffer at all. But in that place, if that's our strongest belief, we'll have almost zero ability to comfort those who are in the midst of suffering because we're believing that they shouldn't be there. But that is why Jesus had to suffer as he did. In Hebrews chapter 2, verse 18, For because he himself has suffered when tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. That word tempted is not about sin, it's testing, it's trial. Jesus was made entirely like us so that he would be an example for us. We suffer. We go through hard times. We have difficult things in our lives. And in the midst of it, that's probably all we can think about. I know that when I have a toothache, my whole body's a tooth. That's all I know. People go through hard times. But he was made like us so that we could understand that whatever we are going through, he has also gone through. <clears throat> in Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 15, it says, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Jesus experienced trials, sufferings, and temptations in the same way that we do and in all points as we do. Now, years ago, many Christians were upset with the rock opera, Jesus Christ Superstar, because in one scene it portrayed Jesus as being tempted by Mary Magdalene. But if he was tempted in all points, the same as us, is it not conceivable that there was possibly a temptation there? Temptation, that's all it was. Paul tells us that whatever our situation may be, it is not unique. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 13, he says, No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. Again, the temptation is not is specifically about tempting to sin, but it's the trial, it's the suffering, it's the testing, it's the difficulty that we go through. It is common to people. It is not uh, your experience alone, although you are alone experiencing it in the moment. Others have been there too. It's a common experience for everyone to suffer through trials. Now, some folks may not appear to be suffering because they have learned how to handle the vicissitudes of life. That comes with time. Trials are simply a part of living in this plane on this planet. And that is what Jesus told his disciples in John chapter 16 and verse 33. He says, I have said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. But take heart, I have overcome the world. I, of 
I can remember the first time I read that verse of scripture, my reaction was, well, whoopee. It just didn't make a whole lot of sense. But in him, I have peace. In the world, I have tribulation. Therefore, could that possibly be a sign for us when our peace is disturbed? Could that mean that we have lost our center in him? Tribulation, trials, and suffering are a part of our existence in this world, but they do not have to disturb us. So what are we to do when we find ourselves in the midst of an ongoing trial? Well, we're not left to our imagination in this as the scriptures give us plenty of ways by which we can comfort and escape the pressures of the trial. So I'm going to close by showing you a few of these verses. In James chapter 5 and verse 13 we read, Is anyone among you suffering? Let him complain and tell everybody else about it. That's not what it says, is it? It says let him pray. But what do we usually do? We complain and tell everybody else about how bad we're suffering. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. In Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 16, let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. When we're suffering through something, it's a need. It's, it's something we need. We need comfort. We need healing. We need a word of encouragement. We need something to help change our situation or the way that we're dealing with that situation. So what do we do? We approach the throne of grace with confidence, not with fear, not with the attitude that I was brought up on, you know, that we're suffering for Jesus. Learn to pray. Looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Jesus looked beyond the suffering. That is much easier said than done. Suffering causes us to focus on our pain. But as we learn to look more and more to the Lord, the easier it becomes to look to Jesus and say, Lord, this is a pile of crap. I need help. Some of us have probably used more coarse language than that, but God knows and understands. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 18, it says, Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. And that's where I got the title that we're to have gratitude for the gift of suffering. It is a gift. But we're to give thanks in all circumstances. It doesn't say for. Not, we're not thanking God for our problem, but in the midst of it, can we learn to continue to be grateful that we're alive, that he's still Lord, that we're still here, and that this too shall pass. Make that, if nothing else, make that your favorite verse in the Bible. Because it's repeated many, many times. And it came to pass. Because it didn't come to stay. It came to pass. Communion this morning reminds us that Jesus suffered, leaving us an example. In 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 21 we read, For to this, this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. Brothers and sisters, may we learn to accept and be grateful in the midst of anything and everything because 
suffering is the only path to perfection available to us. If there was a shorter path to glory for Jesus than through the cross, it would have been made. But it was through the cross that he came into glory. It is through our suffering that we go. So whatever your suffering is this morning, this week, last week, physical, mental, emotional, concern for others, got you down, whatever it is, whatever type of suffering, pray and take it to the Lord. God, this is my burden. Help me to bear it.